finals of the 2012 TOC between Bob Overing and Reagan Grishaber. And we're going to discuss, after every speech, various relevant concerns to winning debate rounds, like strategy, like arguments, um, how they interact with one another, how the cross-examination was, et cetera, et cetera. I hope you find this useful. And yeah, uh, you want to? Are you ready to go, Kirk? Yep. Cool. I affirm firm what is true to always wins today. Value, uh, value, we're not value right here in utility. Have a step to how we correct ethical truths. Answer for what those truths are. I have a correct math step to get all set before we're done correct with value, James. If I'm Boston, what is the start of my kind of path step? Most important that I should think of human habitation at the end of the day. I just want to follow what I say. Myself, the practical value trade is forever and forever. The practical importance of the other suits you can say. Even if that is usual, it is true. If it is true, it is useful. Both these pairs mean exactly the same thing. True ideas would never mean single life such suggesting value unless they have been useful. We can't even set for as maximum and have a different kind of base, therefore can't rationalize it. But it's a problem statement. All statements, even those without practice, do all too, because it is a form of justification one of practical value. There is no such thing as natural who is true, ethics, and our facts are simply what is valuable to accept as true authority. Practice is to redefine the truth of what is good to believe, because given the view of uh, language and the view of the world, one can pair of bits of language from oil, bits of oil, one takes the world to be such a sense of one that leads to true action, one can tell you some more from the things of the world. Once one gets the negative views from universal hypotheticals and the like, such pair will become assy and messy and ad hoc, carrying the excess of the mother lens as well. Why should it be good to believe what is one that we should hold? There, uh, this view of truth is necessary for morality and get action changed. You and I consider the object of the world to be a public of notice and has to be shown to verify truths, make verification process, are we then to call such unverified truths abortive? No, we can say for the overall large number of truths. I for one, two trusts that are living in life's function to save the We are so sure verification is possible that we admit it and are usually justified. The pragmatic theory of truth is that applied to ethics is strongly because you tell the fairness of proof. The resolution truth is the difference between the actual It's a general use of or practical values or true statement. Usually it's the only three facts that accept or take into account. The general pragmatic basis of the issue is no one wants to make the generality of practicality of common practice. As an additional justification, there's no conception of personal identity. Schultz. The continued existence of personal identity is possible to bear into the personal identity of the For example, we can imagine that a neurosurgeon who offers some exception to that operation, the result of the person both physically and psychologically, it roughly half, my former self and half, the thing that the person not described in the immediate case, although, in the immediate case, although, all the relevant facts are no no, the answer leads to the harm of the personal identity is determined in the absence of a stable conception of personal identity, but having the other person fully separate states from the person who provides their actions and consequences, takes that all subsequently, conception of the age and relative standards, their staff, community, and including government, motivation, practice, and violent ability, really, restoration of people, agency, and proportionality, recent based meta-analysis, relative to external identity, state conception of personal identity, applies to which things to your black, relative to the individual, value, versus exactly the same, solely because the absence of the position of definition, state of affairs. Okay, that's pretty much it. Thank you. 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 Thank you
So let's talk about that app. Wait, what was the spike on that under view? Well, if you look at my flowing, it's quite awful because I can't hear it particularly well. Uh -huh. um, I think the bottom spike on the under view, the first one was AFC. Uh -huh. um, and then I know the second and third one were also about um, theory. Yeah. Uh, not quite sure what. And I know the fourth one was like a pre fiat discourse argument about uh -huh. how having this conversation so in particular is right. crucial. Uh -huh. So, unlike the cross examination we watched yesterday between Pranav and David, where Pranav cross ex David, Pranav seemed to have a good understanding of the app after it was read, at least in terms of the big picture. Sure. Right? Here, there are some missing pictures that we would have to fill in in cross ex theoretically. And so I'm not sure how good Reagan's flow was, but you and I would both have to go through our flow and fill in the missing portion. So right. the case structure, in a larger sense, is fairly simple. It's util with a plan specific to Native Americans. Sure. And it has an advantage of stopping domestic violence mm -hmm. and an advantage of patriarchy. Yeah. Um, and then it has one pre fiat discourse argument at the very bottom. Mm -hmm. And then it has several... Uh, theory interps that are worthy of being uh, discussed or at least noted. One is like the underview to the framework where he defines morally permissible as not beneficial. Yeah, theoretically justified due to it. Right. Uh, and then secondly is the underview proper to the case. Um, we, you and I are both unsure what all three of those arguments are. Yeah. Uh, but So the strategy of this case is several different justifications for util. Right, mm -hmm. he takes the pragmatic route via the James arguments. Right. Um, he takes the no conception of personal identity arguments via Schmaltz, um, and he takes the theoretically justified frameworks route as well. Mm -hmm. So he has several different ways out um, on the framework debate, and then he's reading a plan that he just broke new in semis of TOC. So presumably the understanding is it's unlikely for the negative to have a seven-minute straight ref on the Native Americans debate. Um, I'm. My understanding was that this was a brand new plan that people hadn't read before. Uh -huh. So this shows the value of breaking new in terms of plans. Because what this does now, strategically, is it forces the NAG into a situation where it sort of has to engage in the framework debate. It can't just concede util and go hard for uh, turns because it probably doesn't have the turns necessary to engage him. Um, and the 1AR will probably come out ahead on that debate. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. So given that he knows that, he has now given himself numerous ways out in the framework, right? He's given himself the TJFs. Yeah. So notice how smart this app was. Like This right. is a really well-constructed app for this particular debate, right? Um, it decided that we're going to pigeonhole the neg into the framework debate. And it pigeonholed the neg into framework and then gave itself so many different ways out on the framework debate. Um, so when we break new, if we break new, and we're reading a new plan, 
if the plan text is something we don't expect our opponents to have prep on, it's really strategic to formulate the plan such that the plan proper is only about two to three minutes of the case, and the rest of it is setting up the debate for the 1AR. Right? So I would say he invested about a minute here setting up the debate in terms of the actual substantive frameworks. I would say he invested about 20 to 30 seconds on the TJF, and then I would say he invested about uh, 60 to 90 seconds on the interview. Right? So he has, by my count, at least four unique ways out on a framework debate right now. One is the substantive actual framework via the personal identity arguments and the pragmatism arguments. Two is the TJF. Three is AFC. And four is the uh, argument at the very bottom about pre-fiat discourse, that this is the conversation we need to have. Right? The this is the conversation we need to have argument may not potentially be relevant on a framework, because Reagan could potentially be like, yeah, we need to have this conversation, but we should have this conversation from a means-based perspective, not from an ends-based perspective, right? But it's definitely going to be relevant on some sort of spec debate where uh, somebody, where Reagan's like, you can't spec Native Americans, um, and you can't defend only Native Americans. So the AF has changed the scope of the resolution from whole res to specific to Native Americans, and it has done so in the understanding that the negative probably won't have a ton of prep ready to go on the actual um, case debate. So if you're the negative sitting here at the end of the 1AC prior to cross-examination, what are the different thoughts that should be going through your head? Uh, well, first I would want to like clarify what, my, what the underview is. Second, I want to know if he will defend links into like the whole resolution, which is he's probably not going to. Third, uh, I would want to. Uh, uh, I I don't know because I'm probably not going to engage him on the advantage level, so I'm probably not going to ask him much about, about that. Maybe like make few analytics, but uh, I would still know that he's going to come out ahead on the advantage layer because like. It's being broken you, so I like I probably have to up layer some way to either like use theory or K or uh, just run an NC, but then I have to respond to like lots of different spikes. So I think it's just more strategic in this instance to up layer because I have to respond to way too much because he knows that he's prepping for a framework. Right. So now the danger I guess I have in my mind with you up layering is um, it seems like. If the 1AR walk, or if the AF walks into the round knowing that the predominant next strategy will be to up layer, the 1AR can also be let ready. It's easier for the 1AR to win the debate when it knows that the 1N will not engage with it substantively, sure. yeah. because now it has the substantive out in terms of case, and it just has to collapse the layers back down to the AF, right? Yeah. So I actually think that in this cross examination, the first thing I would do is also ask about the links. Like, would you defend other links? Uh, expecting him to say no. The second thing I would ask him is, does he have any justifications that permit him to specify the resolution down from whole res to Native Americans? I would try to figure out what in the app interacts with the potential T argument I would read, um, right? That's the second thing I would do. Uh, third thing I would do is uh, I would ask him what in the app interacts theoretically with a different framework, like uh, which theory arguments can he extend in the 1AC? to beat back a neg framework that's like down, for example, right? Uh, and so that forces him to pinpoint all the arguments in the case that would have interactional work. Yeah. Um, then I think that I would focus on uh, the actual framework arguments. Um, I agree with you, I would probably leave the case alone. So like, it seems like down here would seem to negate. It would seem to say that, you know, it's probably not okay yeah. for victims to use deadly force. Um, so that's one thing. Second is if you could construct a counter plan, that would be awesome. Oh, yeah. Because it would, see, it, it would take away the um, urgency of the situation in terms of the argument that their only recourse right now is uh, deadly force, right? Um, so that would be fantastic if we could somehow construct a CP as well. Um, and then the third thing is you'd have to figure out which theory violations you want to go for the most, right? Like you're definitely probably going to read T here. Because yeah. this app does seem to have a specification issue that we feel comfortable engaging on, right? Um, but then the next question is, what other shell do you want to read? Uh, so do you want to read AFC bad, knowing that the 1AR is going to be super prepped on the AFC debate? Or would you rather read something like, you can't have a TJF with a normally yeah. justified yeah, that's, framework? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. Right. So 
I guess the question that needs to happen here then, uh, or the conversation that needs to happen, is we need to be able to predict what the 1AR is most comfortable going for on the theory debate. And if possible, if there is an equally persuasive shell that we can read in lieu of the shell that the 1AR is most ready to go for, it seems strategic for us to go for the other one. Yeah. Now, the question becomes, if you're conceding AFC, do you want to violate it via a framework? Yeah. Right? Because if you violate it via a framework, then you have to respond to AFC. Um, so if you decide not to violate it via a framework, and you decide to go T theory, um, then you're forced into the position where your next two or three minutes worth of arguments need to either be util responses, like you need to try to straight turn the case, um, or it needs to be um, it, it needs to be a K. Yeah. Right. I think there is a persuasive K here to be had about the use of the word Indian yeah, to describe that's what I was Native thinking, Americans. Right. Um, but I, I'm not sure if like I know for sure because I was coaching Reagan at this tournament that he didn't have that like we 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 weren't like oh yeah we should just you know cut. A K against the word Indian because it's very likely to be used, right? <laughs> so this is sort of a situation where you can't really predict that you would have ended up in this situation. Um, so I don't know. I'm not really sure. I think that you know the negative is in a tricky position here because if it wants to generate offense more than just through T and theory, then it needs to uh, really commit to either violating AFC or generating another layer that's in the form of some sort of K, right? right? So something that Jackson actually started doing this year um, that I've become more of a fan of is going for basically six to six and a half minutes of theory and going for about a minute of uh, answers to the util debate. So generating the analytical turns and generating the analytical offense via SCP. So that lets you avoid the AFC debate. It lets you construct two different shells, T and theory, and it lets you go for either bait in the 2 and R and weigh accordingly. Sure. Yeah. Right? And then the shells were really fleshed out and thought out and really long. Um, and that also lets you deal with, like, any of the theory spikes in the app. Right. Yeah. So that option, though, is not very uh, appealing to... Uh, I guess it's not not very appealing, but the thing that doesn't appeal to me about that option is two things. The A point is that I, th I think judges don't appreciate when there's no substantive engagement on case. Like, we want to see you talk about the topic, and seven minutes of theory in the NC or six minutes of theory in the NC is not exactly talking about the topic. Um, I think that this concern, though, should not be your priority in terms of concerns, because if the AF is written in the way it's written, it's sort of written to design, it's designed to avoid clashing hard on case or on the topic. So it seems like if that's the case, then, um, you know, you might just have to bite the bullet and read theory. But the B point I have here in terms of my concern is a very good theory debater like Bob, this is his comfort, right? So that 1AR is going to be responsive, it's going to be comprehensive, and it's going to be quick. Like he's going to get a lot out and he's going to respond. So that 2NR is going to have to be baller. It's going to have to be really good and it's going to have to make sure it covers and it's going to have to make sure it weighs and it's going to have to make sure it ties up loose ends, right? So what you're doing is you're putting all your eggs in the basket that Bob is also most comfortable in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so this really was a brilliant app in terms of the way it was written. Do you see the strategic value of it? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Cool. Um, so if you're ready, let's uh, go to cross-examination. Yeah. Cool. Oh, wait. Actually, I can change something. Um, whatever you're just talking about. So I want you to write down during cross X all the things that Reagan tries to accomplish. Okay.
Okay, so here's, obviously the audio on that was not the best. Um, here's what I've written down in terms of the things like the Brigand did. So first, he asked, he confirmed that there was a theoretically justified mm -hmm. framework justification. Okay. Then he pressed uh, Bob a little bit on solvency. Mm -hmm. His point was that the solvency evidence in the app was not specific to natives, so right. he was allowed to read solvency evidence in the neg that's not specific to natives, mm -hmm. which is potentially a very useful um, uh, concession in terms of uh, the util debate. But sure. uh, if you notice, Reagan's not particularly dominant right now. He's not right. speaking, he's, his tone is very soft, he's not pushy, he's nowhere near as dominant as Pranav was, right? Um, and so in terms of perceptual dominance, I feel like Reagan could have done a lot of work here, right? Because Bob is trying to weasel out of this and being like, yo, like the evidence in my first advantage is actually specific. So my case is a combination of germane and specific evidence, right? right. Um, and Reagan really could have pressed him on that and said, so if I show that the germane evidence in terms of the solvency evidence actually flows neg, i.e. that you don't solve that domestic violence is counterproductive, do I get to access the link turn into your advantages? right? Mm -hmm. And then really pushed him there and really had that conversation, right? Because the response that my advantages are specific doesn't seem to have any sort of it's interaction. With the solvency. Like exactly. Solvency has to be an issue of like specificity to the plan too, not just like the advantage. Exactly. Right? So if you're controlling the direction of the solvency evidence, not just in terms of terminal defense, i.e. the app does not solve, but in terms of the link turn, i.e. the app is counterproductive, it increases the problem of domestic violence right. in the world of the app via deadly force, then it seems like you hijack the link into patriarchy and you hijack the link into um, solving domestic violence. So I think that's a problem, like, when you try to, like, uh, when you only go for the link defense, that sort of makes sense, but when you try to go for a link turn like that, what that the app causes the more domestic violence, I think the uh, Bob can leverage the specificity of his advantage, like, really well, because, like, uh, sure, it may cause, like, uh, more domestic violence in like general aspects, but not in Native Americans. So even if it's like his solvency is like uh, too uh, like too ge is generic to the resolution, I think that if you're going to try to make a link turn on specifically the advantages, it's 
it's sort yeah, of hard to I do see that. what you're saying. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. But here's another thought. If you read the T-shell about specificity, and one of your arguments are about how the app always leverages more specific ground, and then you also conduct the util debate the oh, way we true. just talked about it, yeah. right? The one ER has to bite a bullet here, because either it yeah. uses the specificity of the advantages to get itself out of the link turn on yeah. solvency, but that proves, but the, that abuse. proves the abuse on T. Right. Exactly. So this is what people talk about when they say that proving the theoretical abuse is much more persuasive to me. And they're like when people in judge paradigms, right? I like to see actual abuse, not potential abuse. This would be an example of actual abuse. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it seems like at this point in cross examination, a uh, very very strategic one NC could be T theory util, and on the util debate, the hope is to either come out marginally ahead or make it close enough that the 1AR has to spend some time on the util debate and also to pr ideally have the 1AR prove the abuse on T. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and so avoiding AFC altogether. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The next question that Reagan does, so the next thing Reagan does is he talks about the, uh, he asks the framework question regarding Blackburn and James, right? This is, he doesn't get anything out of this. It's very unpersuasive. It's like 15, 20 seconds. Sure. Don't really understand why he's here, what he got out of it, right? Uh -huh. Seems to be a couple of clarification questions. He's not really pushing on him on it. So for our purposes and essences, like this is essentially a waste of time sure. in the cross-examination. Then after this, what's baffling is that there's a really long pause. There's yeah. like a 30 second yeah, long yeah. pause, right? Um, we want to avoid that because now Reagan has reduced his cross-examination to two minutes and 30 seconds as opposed right. to three minutes. Okay, so then... The fifth thing that happens in this cross-examination is that he questions um, Bob in terms of uh, Kantianism and whether or not it violates the underview on the framework uh, because Bob's framework is like, yo, every other ethical philosophy is a nit. Yeah, yeah um, like, yeah, so, so I guess like one of the arguments on the underview was necessary but insufficient burden. Like, yeah, I, he tried to play, I think he did what you did, like what would violate, well, he didn't do exactly what you said, like what would violate. Uh, what interps would I violate if I read a client and see, but rather picking a specific interp. But I think that's less strategic because there might be like other interps in the AC that he might violate. Right. So I think that Reagan could have really gotten a lot out of this cross-examination by focusing on this specific part and um, being like, yo, like I'm going to read a Kant and see that is this premise. It, let's walk through all the theoretical arguments in the AF that would interact with this NC, right? And then really pushing him on this and being like, like, I, do you not understand Kant? How is this a nib, right? You could turn it by saying X, Y, and Z. Like, how would that be a nib? Explain to me. I don't understand. Right? And being really aggressive about this and not being really as late. Like, it's very clear right now that Reagan is just chilling out. Like, he is right. tired. Yeah. It's been a long tournament <laughs> for him. He's just, like, relaxed, right? Yeah. Um, in some sort of senses, it's almost like he's happy to be there, right? It's not like he's pumped up and fired and, like, ready to go. Um, like, this is not exactly the most testosterone-filled cross-examination <laughs> that we've ever seen, sure. right? Um, so... The last thing Reagan does is he questions Bob about predictability. Uh -huh. um, and those are some good questions that he's asking, but he d runs out of time at the end and also doesn't get to really push Bob on it, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Wait, what was his, oh, his questions about like real world policy making? No, his, so Bob's argument was that like policy debate does util, so it's predictable that I'm reading oh. util, right? And Reagan's okay. like, well, aren't we debating LD? Like, why do we care about what policy is doing? Sure. Right? I think the better way to formulate that question, obviously ask that question, but then the follow-up should be that given that you're so concerned about what the activities are running in terms of like normally, isn't it the case that a lot of people have been reading Kant this year? Like, how uh, would Kant not be not predictable to you? Yeah. Like, we have competed in the same circuit throughout the year. You have seen and probably responded to hundreds of Kant cases by now. How would that not be predictable? Sure. Right? Um, and then having a conversation, if Reagan, if Bob is like, no, it may be predictable, but you two will be more predictable, then having a conversation about how predictable is enough predictable, right? Like, where's the bright line on predictability? Do yeah. we have to be the most predictable, or is there a cer certain period at which it's predictable enough that we are okay with it? Does that make sense? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Cool. So, a better, cr so, difference between the cross X we saw here and the cross X we saw yesterday with Pranav. Pranav focused on three things. This cross X focused on five or six things, right? So this is our first foray into the truth that the more things you focus on in cross-examination, the less effective and damning your cross-examination will be, yeah. right? So CX really needs to narrow down and focus on two to three issues, uh -huh. right? Sure. And in this case, those two to three issues probably should have been theoretical, uh 
Uh-huh. I think the solvency arguments were great, like focusing on solvency. Right. I think also establishing that his NC was fair uh, would have been great. And I think also pushing him on some of like the predictability arguments or the TJFs would have also been great. Yeah. Makes sense? Um, notice how there's no lip service here in cross-examination to the last card in the AC about how this conversation is discursively like a uh, prerequisite to ethical deliberation, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that, like, it shows that he's probably not running like a spec, like a spec theory or something. Right, or just Reagan straight up forgot about it. Oh, really? One of the two, right? Sure. We'll find out at the end of the one NC. But notice how, like, I would have probably asked at least something about it. Right, yeah. Like, like or at least the question, if you ask the Kantianism question properly, like, I'm going to read a Kant NC, explain to me everything that interacts with the Kant NC, aside from your framework proper, i.e. the James, Blackburn, and Schmoltz analysis. Oh, right. that's, a, I think your phrasing of that question, like what interacts with instead of like what violates it is like really effective because they can get, because he can uh, wiggle out of the case that's like, oh, it doesn't like violate this. But right. if you ask like what interacts with it, that's more effective. Right. And so then if he doesn't mention the card at the bottom of the case uh, and he goes for it in the 1AR, your 2NR can be very clear. Like I asked him in cross-examination everything that interacted with this NC and he did not mention the card at the bottom of the app. Yeah. This means either he was lying to me in cross-examination and that should be an automatic reason he loses or he um, is misrepresenting how this card functions. Either way, given that I was incredibly clear in cross-examination that I wanted to know everything that interacted and we went through comprehensively the entire list, this card should not have any sort of interaction with the NC. However, even if for some reason you grant him this access, which would be really ridiculous, let's make actual responses to it as well. Yeah. Make, make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so... Now let's watch the one end. Wait, so like, uh, given that you asked that question, like what interacts with the NC, do, do, do they have to like point out what on their advantages can turn the NC? Like, for example, on the living wage topic that... Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I would say, like the way, it depends on how you formulate the question. Like, explain to me what arguments interact with the NC uh, framework or explain to me what arguments interact with the NC period. That's different, right? Like if it's NC framework, um, I guess it's not that different. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question, Craig. It's, uh, I, I think that if I was responding to that question, I would mention that the case could potentially turn the NC, yeah. right? But I think that's in a, like, just like an understood assumption about how debate sure. works, yeah. that like, case can always turn NCs. Um, so I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool? Yeah. Okay. So let's watch. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. 
So the conversation we had prior to the 1n was that we thought the most strategic 1n would be t plus a shell that wasn't about AFC, because that's presumably what the 1a would be most ready to go, and some strategy that didn't violate 1ac so that he couldn't go for, one a, for AFC in the 1AR. So what did the 1N do? Uh, read theory on uh, theoretically justifying framework. Wait, did it have a plank about like reading, reading plans and theoretically justifying framework? I didn't catch that plank. Because I... I uh, he because made I, that argument on ground, like this is, mag this is supercharged by the fact yeah, that... Yeah, I think it'd be like way more persuasive if like he can put a plank that you can't read you can't read like theoretically justified frameworks uh, if you have a plan because that allows you to like cherry pick the best ground and like basically uh, you, you can like you can find the best ground for a plan and then like read theoretically justified framework which means that you're always guaranteed to win like the contention level offense. Yeah, um, I think that that's a big mistake. Obviously, not having a plank. But let's talk about big picture first. Sure. So the big picture was fra was NC uh -huh. theory AC theory was about AFC uh -huh. uh, and. Uh, AC had one turn on case. So, he's really putting a lot of eggs in the basket of winning AFC. He's also putting a lot of eggs in the basket of winning that AFC is an offensive interp for him. Because mm -hmm. if he loses AFC as an offensive interp for him, he's in the position where he has to win AFC to access the framework debate. Then he has to win the framework debate in order to access an egg offense. Right. So he essentially has two nibs that he has to go through in order to get access to the ballot. Right, yeah. Right? Um, the ass would have to be really, really poor in order to lose the util debate here in the 1AR. Right. Okay. Like, you'd have to be awful, right? If you can't respond to the one turn about killing people bad, like, I just don't really know what to tell you. Yeah. Um, you just, I, yeah, it's time to reassess whether or not you want to do debate. <laughs> um, so it's really, really easy for the ass to win the util debate here. So once the ass has won the util debate, it has... One other thing it needs to resolve for sure is AFC. Right. And it can resolve AFC in a plethora of ways. It can resolve AFC by winning that there on the side of the offensive interp. Because if it's the case that Bob is the offensive interp and Reagan's the counter interp, then Bob can concede AFC and just win the framework debate. I think that's what the norm is, is that if you read AFC, then yours is the... Yours is the interp, and the other one's the counter interp, but they can be a, like an offensive counter interp if it says like must. So Reagan could gain access to his offense. Right, and so it's not clear, but we're talking about what the NC has done in terms of what the 1AR positions are now, uh -huh. right? Like the 1AR has a lot of ways out. The sure. 1AR can um, change the status of who gets offensive or net defensive arguments on AFC and then just win framework. Um, the 1AR could change status of AFC in terms of interp, counter interp, and then concede neg framework and turn neg, mm -hmm. right? The 1AR could win the AFC debate, like, on the line by line, uh, and win that AFC is offensive for him, and there's a clear violation now, because Reagan read an NC, right. uh, which means that he wins the debate on theory. Mm -hmm. And then after that, he could also go for the framework debate and give himself a second way out. Um, but what would be the point of that if, like, he's... Just the point of that is that if the 2NR wins the line by line on the AFC debate, but drops the interp counter interp stuff, then the 2AR is able to kick the AFC debate and go for framework. Yeah, but he would need to layer that strategy also with uh, that uh, his is the interp and uh, Reagan's is the counter interp. He will definitely need to layer his strategy with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so basically, the 1AR has a lot of options here. Yeah. Um, the 1N was not the strongest, right? Technically, Reagan was amazing, right? Sure. Reagan is fast. He doesn't stumble. He gets through arguments. Um, but like, strategically. Strategically, this was lacking, sure. right? So do you see why when we talk about like being really good, it's not just tech. It's also strategic strategy. Right. Like This is why I keep telling you, you don't have to be the fastest in order to win. You uh, definitely need to be the most strategic in order right. to win, right? Like, it doesn't... like. In this round, Reagan was technically very, very good, but he has put himself in a position after the NC that is not the most dominant or good position to be in. Right. Right? Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was specificity of interps. I feel like the most damning interp here would be um, AF can read AFC only with a plan only if they've disclosed the plan online. Oh, yeah. Right? Sure. So that way it doesn't, 
Like, essentially, what ra that, that forces Bob into defending the practice of reading AFC when you break a new plan. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you say that every other instance is okay. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, that, that makes it pretty hard for him, yeah. Yeah, so generating the specific reasons there why reading AFC with a brand new plan and that's being broken is going to be difficult. Yeah, and plus, like, he, he can, uh, like, co-opt all the arguments why AFC is good. Like, sure, AFC may be good, like, in these instances, but, right, but not when you break new. Right, not when you break new. Um, especially when you break new in the with form a of a plan. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, cool. Okay, so specific interps would have done a lot for Reagan here. Yeah. Cool? All right, so let's watch cross-examination. Ready? Yeah. Okay, so that CX was primarily a clarification. Yeah, made clarifying CX. a lot of arguments. Right. So that's not a bad thing. This is actually an excellent example of a cross examination where the purpose was clarification. Sure. Right. Uh, I don't think that Bob could have done much different because he probably know like what his strategy was going to be already. I right. Think, yeah. And so he's really just making sure he doesn't miss anything. Sure. Right. So the first question is a good question, which is that. Um, your death outweighs argument is the only useful offense you have, right? 
Uh, and so what that does is that just makes sure that Reagan didn't hide offense anywhere else on the utility. Right. right? Um, then the next thing Bob does is he talks about pragmatism. Like he doesn't, he's, try, he's trying to understand why Reagan's arguments link into the pragmatism debate. Right. Um, and I think that the argument Reagan made there was quite brilliant. Like using the epistemological justification for pragmatism to sever yeah. the link from util to pragmatism yeah. uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, the next thing that Bob does is he goes to the NC and spends basically the rest of his time on the NC. Um, in, well, in between, I'm not sure if he went to theory. It sort of sounded like he did for a second. Um, but on the NC, he talks about why this government leads to universality and trying to understand that. Um, and then in the middle, I'm not really sure, in between the Bellarmine stuff and the Camus question, I'm not sure what he was doing because I couldn't hear very well. But it sounded like he was talking about theory and trying to figure out like why the intrep was offensive. Um, okay. But, yeah, so this CX, both of these CXs were not particularly dominant. Um, both of them were clarification-based. It does seem like Bob was a little bit more in control, though, than sure. Reagan does. Um, but yeah, in terms of this debate, not much has been revealed in cross-examination. Mm -hmm. In the last debate we watched, it was pretty clear that Pranav killed David in cross-examination, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the difference between clarification-based CX and dominance-based CX is in dominant-based CX, you really want to make sure that you're the one talking more than your opponent. You're controlling the amount of time talked like or spoken, right? right? Uh, talked is not a word. <laughs> um, and in clarification-based CX, obviously you can't do most of the talking because you're trying to have your opponent explain things to you, uh -huh. right? Sure. Uh, so in this debate, neither debaters are, uh, you know, sort of slimy, and they're both pretty, like, upfront about their arguments, and they're both trying to explain it at the yeah. best clarity possible. But in debates where debaters are sort of sketchy and, like, purposely take roundabout ways to explain things, and we will watch a debate like that later on in this camp. Uh -huh. um, when debaters do that, then it's a unique skill to be able to uh, sort of get them moving to clarify exactly what you need to get clarified. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. Cool. So, uh, let's see what the one here does. Wait, what do you say? Wait, what was, uh, oh, what did we say I, that was the no? most strategic option for the one end? Uh, I think the most strategic option for the one end is, uh, doing T, theory, UTO. Okay. And theory would be something like, you can't have TJF and, uh, framework classifications at the same time. So, like, uh, the... So I think the accepted norm is that if like no, uh, if you say that uh, app can't uh, meet the AFC, that's more of an offensive counterinterp. But if you say that like app can't read, uh, app can only read AFC when this condition, that would just make it an interp, right? Because the practice is not defended in the AC, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're gonna have a, a long session where we talk about interps versus counterinterps, specifically in the form of AFC. But I think that your summary there is pretty correct. Sure. Okay. Cool. All right. So are you ready to flow the 1AR? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You might want to come over to this one right sure. here. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Now the order is going to be uh, his theory arguments. AC. I think Bob, Bob is easier to throw because he's rather. Yeah. <laughs> his it might also be the way the microphone is placed. AC top down. His interpretation, he has access to run, he just has to do it within the theoretical constellation of the text of his interpretation. He has to give the access to run, he can do that, he just has to run. You talk at the theoretical constellation, that's this right for the best. But second, I mean, you could die, I, I, I don't get to run anywhere, he just has to be theoretical just by that. Coming to the AC, that blocks all the theoretical systems, it's not fair. Then you can run around and say that I have the theory is unfair, but this is the practice of choosing is unfair. Third, this is a counter interpretation of the AC, argument is interpretation, but also this is just a counter interpretation of 
you know, you know, you need no offense for the next. Nobody gets really to his voting arguments for the time. If you can test it with the consequences, meta as the way you can still have your philosophy ground for as long as you just say that there's something else that's more important. Under consequences, he does that in a sense when he reads those practice the practice of arguments in the 1850. It's not competitive. He has to show he has ethical theories actually prepared for more. He has to show that Kantianism is fair in order to be able to win on my argument of the interpretation of the AC and saying that it's usual. It's not like what uh, you, you would have to show that your uh, ethical theory is more fair. Go to his philosophy or to education arguments. He says uh, his first argument is based on uh, it's how we uh, do our lives. However, uh, turn philosophical education makes you a moral positor. Active moralism did not succeed in knowing the world thinks it's not found enough to earn motivation for doing tools. In active moralism, there's people to override self interest. There is no message to prove itself. The reader can easily find a rationalization for your pres- uh, preferred course of conduct, whatever it is. And that, uh, that turns back to that argument. It's actually going to be bad for us. Go to value Spain. LD is uh, the sub point B. Uh, first, LD's values are relative passes, no meaningful values prescribed in the process of debate, scam, trick, sex, no impact, parents, mind, uh, system of debate, best, which change, what it means to LD debate, third, talk of debate, more critical, the majority of the residents, not philosophically awarded, and fourth, this might be true enough for topics like you want to say, but it's not, uh, once it's lit, discuss concrete impact solutions to the EV, and fifth, uh, uh predictable, the threshold, good topic debate, sort of means the threshold also be utile, it's not predictable, you can say that topic debate currently, uh, certainly isn't. Go to the, uh, skills education on, uh, the critical thinking argument. Uh, first, uh, first, these warrants are unique to philosophy. It's content to uh, debate. Uh, you also have to construct a value that control the fantastic position. Second turn, uh, philosophy and LD curls and kills critical thinking. Also, oblivion, one liner, spikes back from visibility. Take no real thought at all. Third turn, top debate, but for active skills making the position. Because you defend a specific action, not debate. Moral theory can shift uh, from speech to speech. All right. Uh, and then, as an overview of these arguments, uh, first, uh, my interpretation allows after the time one of the pure souls generally is what is the right action this means that you're for, and you could have a moral debate on divine interpretation of the second turn. Uh, apply philosophy that you could argue what it means to uh, apply consequences when you get more depth on specific moral theories of winning analysis. Uh, third, turn they could select down a bad moral debate the second the same favorite cards of lip throwing and clicks and trick triggers here. Uh, in terms of those walking uh, philosophy and empirically proven uh, natural sort of, uh, natural circuit framework debates are simply not educational. Go to the ground argument. Turn the ground argument that he causes the side bias neg. 188% of two CXs during the time two negative points of probability are vanished by pursuing strategies to upload include AC on subs at the end result of the strategy for a fair consultation theory is is force the air and get through a new layer of before being able to gain the case made any arguments available with this ground should be disallowed. Second case to show the usual is not fair, otherwise this argument doesn't function. Go to uh, education. Fair, fair, fairness, uh, fairness uh, outweighs education first. Debate is deployed without fairness. Debate that I cannot opposite the active will not force having to be loose. Value perspective analysis of debate means general disqualified debate. Second, what do you require for a good point? Do you write discussion also with me more topical education and valuable? Only for two months of public goals in our lives. Outside of debate and uh, fairness is a question of balance means to come before. Education, you can uh, education is valuable. You can damn value at the round. AC. On the over. Oh. Those are all reasons why util is true because it's my uh, topicality interpretation is preferable. Go to the overview. This is specific to maximum the resolution now working an FQ. You can think of my argument is to act practices and assist rule practices. This is what you do it has to be correct. I'm not saying as a theory that it has to be true, but second, uh, this is just defense minds for the CDS to show the case. Actual argument is more uh, pragmatic. Off the first argument first, just defense and application does mean that's not useful. Second, yes, it shows relevant to the resolution. There's a chain of infinite calculation there. Third is not unique the answer. We have to be able to break what their intentions are, whether or not they're good. We can't calculate the bottom argument. That makes sense in context of the design. I, uh, because of the I'm only to find down for the resolution. That's uh, what we should do. Second, uh, second, we still uh, look at short time frame impacts first. They uh, actually have some sort of out of the consequence. You said the James argument is controlled to the actual information because it literally has values of motivation. There's nothing else necessary to normal theory because we can start our values to fall in line with that. Happens the world that excludes the negative case. You can accept the plan to the American use of the personal liberal response. Is one of the arguments that way that South Korea has said, save eight lives for everyone. That's all I need in order to be able to offer the theory to control. So, control the answer with the negative argument because if violating someone's value is bad, then violating eight people's value is bad as well. There's no activist distinction argument in the Okay. What do you think? Uh, I don't. I don't know if he was. Wait, did he respond to the util turn? No. Oh shit. Yeah. I mean, I haven't watched this round in a while, but I forgot that Bob does that. Um. He didn't respond to the u- Wait, what was the turn again? This is pretty bad, right? You kill people, and death is definitely worse. Like, it wait, how does he? Sure. How does he kill? Because deadly force kills like the perpetrator. Oh, okay. Um, So Bob doesn't get time to go to the actual util debate. Uh But Bob, so... But he still leaves himself, like, a way out that he Which is the theory. Right, yeah. Right. So Bob doesn't have to win the util debate. Uh But if Bob had allocated time just 10 seconds differently, he could have given himself the frame, the substantive out as well. Do you think it'd been more strategic for him to go for, uh, to go on the uh, uh, util argument first and then go on the TJFs because he knows that 
he's going to only spend like a, such a little time that, that he probably should spend it. But in case if he runs out, uh, he should like make it run out on like theory instead of on the uh, on like substance. I'm sorry. What? Do you think that his speech order should have been like to address the Uto turn first and then respond to the uh, TJFs and then the framework debate to ensure that he has time? Because like I've been taught that to always respond to theory first, but in this instance, when there's only like one argument on like case that you need to respond to, and it's not a particularly good argument. Yeah, I don't think that's a bad idea. Like fifteen seconds on case, then theory, then back to framework. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm thinking now about the 2 and R, right? Okay. If you're the 2 and R here, you still have chances to win this debate. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing is, Bob doesn't really make a bunch of arguments for why Reagan violates um, some type of shell that he's... Yeah, playing, that's what right? I was thinking of, too. Yeah. So it seems like Bob or Reagan could extend the IME, saying there's no violation of his inter. Then he could say that the 1AR did not extend a shell or a violation to his shell. Right, which means that there is no theoretical violation for the judges to vote off of, which leaves the only thing left is the actual case debate, and extending the I meet means Bob gets access to AFC, which means he gets that util is the framework for the debate, which means all that's left is the util debate, which is the turn. Yeah, that's that's pretty strategic. Yeah, that would be a, in a very quick collapse. Right. Uh -huh. Right. Um, now. I think for Reagan, though, if he goes for the theory debate, it's irrelevant, right? Like, yeah, like he could go for the theory debate and still lose, and the outcome would be the same. So if Reagan establishes that Bob did not give a violation to, like, did not read a shell that has a violation or extend a shell with a violation in the 1AR, uh -huh. right, um, then uh, Reagan essentially is in the position now where theory is a no-risk issue for him. If he wins on theory, great. If he doesn't win on theory, then the rounds collapse down to the util debate. And on the util debate, he's the only one with offense right now. Oh, sure. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. um, now, here's the thing, Kirk. There's this round, this 1AR is a fantastic example of embedded clash, right? Oh, right. Because even though Bob, Bob did not formally say the words extend my interpretation, yeah, uh, but he, he did a lot of that on the shell itself. So you're not like, sure. It's very clear that there's a violation on the original app in terms, right? Even if it's not explicitly extended. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure judges would buy Reagan's argument that there wasn't an explicit extension. Sure. Right? Like, babe, Bob could probably get along, get away with being like, look, like, gut check app here. Like, the app was four minutes, like, the one hour was four minutes long, and I got through a lot, like, the fact that I didn't say specifically the words extend this interp shouldn't take away the fact that over three minutes of my arguments were based on embedded clash that was assuming that he violated my interp. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's really interesting. This 1AR was quite good, I thought, on a lot of levels, especially the theoretical level. I think Bob did quite a good job responding to it theoretically. I think he went for overkill on Phil Ed. Personally, yeah, I think so. Like, too. I think that he could have saved some time on Phil Ed and uh, put it back. Like, I don't know if he needed the overview that he has um, on Phil Ed that he read at the very bottom of the Phil Ed standard. Um, I think he could have saved that time to formally extend the interp in the violation from the AC and also to win himself the Utah debate. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, this 1AR was quite good, but it was lacking in two areas. One was it didn't win the util debate, and two was it could have ex like it could have um, explicitly extended the interp and the violation. So I want to redo this one AR where you do those two things and you try to make as many arguments as Bob did on the theory debate. Like if you look at the theory flow, I'm looking at my theory flow. Bob really put a lot out there. Yeah. Like, this was a very responsive one. Yeah, well, plus, like, all the different I meets was, like, pretty astounding to me. Yeah. yeah. They were very smart. Bob was yeah. an incredible theory debater. Um, so, yeah, the I meets were unique. They were smart. Uh, and they're going to make the 2NR work if the 2NR wants to win the theory debate. Uh -huh. yeah. So, walking into this 2NR, Reagan has two ways to win the round. One is if he can win on theory uh -huh. and win that his shell is an interp. 
right? Yeah. That way seems to be hard. It's doable, but it's hard. Yeah. And sure. then the second is if he can win on um, case. Mm -hmm. But to get to case, he has to either make theory a non-voting issue or win that there is no uh, violation. It's going to be impossible for him to make it a non-voting issue because he read reject the debater in the one end. Right. So theory is a voting issue, uh -huh. right? Now it's just a question of is there something to vote on, right? right? Uh -huh. And so if he can somehow establish that Bob did not like extend a violation or like construct a violation, and he can collapse the debate to util, he would win. Right. Yeah. Now, the third thing that the third other option that Reagan has here is to bite the bullet on the, that he's a counter-interp, win the interp counter interp debate, win the pragmatism arguments to get access to the Dayon framework, and win under Dayon. Yeah, but I think that's a little too much. Right. So we talk about collapsing and not going for too much, right? Yeah. It seems like in this debate, going for the NC would require him to win a couple of different nips. Right, yeah. And so the NC should be something that's kicked. <laughs> and it should, if he's going to win underneath the framework, it should be the util framework. Okay, so um, let's watch the 2 and R. Very, very interesting strategy, yeah? Yeah. First of all, there's a zero reason for why there's no activation in the suit. There is an activation in the because it creates an improv piece. You're not having an activation in the suit. You have an infinite number. I'll start when you're ready. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm messing my TV. Oh. Alright, I'm good. You're good? Yeah. Wait, 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 wait hold on. This is not good. Yeah. Where's the theory? And like go for the util turn. That that's like that's like a big uh, error. Like uh, he he didn't even exploit his util turn. I didn't notice that Bob dropped it or something. I don't I don't know why he didn't go for the turn. Okay. To summarize, so what you just said, the first thought we have about whether or not this two and R was strategic was it probably went for the wrong framework. Right. Okay. The second thought you just had was that it was. Interesting to see him leverage the number three argument on the ground argument uh -huh. that the AC had on the interp counter interp sure. debate that's happening at the NC Red. Right, and then he should also point out the fact that he, uh, Bob didn't ex extend an explicit violation to his interp and then uh, t to his own interp, which means that even if he loses theory, he's still winning on substance, which means that you should vote. I don't know how persuaded judges would be by that argument, but it's still an argument that he could have made that could have. Could maybe could have gained him some traction. Okay, so the one thing I think you're not noticing that I noticed immediately, um, and that concerns me the most, is that a lot of Reagan's tunar was not responsive to Bob's one AR. Oh, that, really? Like, for example, Reagan extended this argument that education outweighs fairness. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah that's But true. doesn't yeah, respond to the arguments that Bob's making for yeah. why fairness outweighs education. Also, like, he, he, I noticed that he, like, extended his ground arguments, but, like, didn't respond to Bob's arguments on ground. He just, like, I, it, yeah, that's, like, another thing I noticed. Right. Um, so, he, also on phil -ed, Yeah. he extended phil -ed and didn't respond to, like, the overview, for example. Sure. Um, nor did he respond to the arguments that, like, philosophy and LD debate is bad because it's about blippy one-liners, yeah. right? So this tunar is a great example of how even though technically you can be amazing, substantively you can avoid engagement. Or I don't think Reagan did it on purpose. I think he just like didn't have enough prep time to go down the line by line. Sure. Right? So this speech is extending through a lot of ink and mm -hmm. not really responding to that ink. Okay. So in that sense, it's really not persuasive for judges. Right, like this seems to be a very easy win for the AF now. Okay. Um, in the sense that, like, if it wins the turns on Phil Ed, then the internal link contestation is irrelevant. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and there seems to be at least one turn that's just there's no ink on it whatsoever. Yeah. Um. Now, 
In terms of strategy, I think this 2NR was poor on several levels. One is I would have conceded fairness over education. And I would have used the extension of the ground, or the argument that topic education, like field debate controls internal links to topic debate. And I would have said, look, if your pause and return is true that field debate is bad, that means that the mechanism by which we access topic debate is bad, and that means topic debate is also probably bad. Right? So that means in terms of education, there is no net advantage or disadvantage. Okay, sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Additionally, so I would have phrased it as several ways. I would have started the 2NR by going like, like, like this. I would have said, so, I, so the 2NR I would have started with, the first question you need to ask yourself on the theory debate is what's more important, fairness to education? One AR is making reasons why fairness outweighs education. I will concede those reasons, which means that the ground standard definitely comes before the philosophical education standard. He has several pieces of offense on the phil ed standard, but doesn't have any offense on the ground standard other than the impact turn, which I will address in depth later on in this speech. So let's deal with phil ed first. The first problem here is you're conceding the number three argument on your ground argument on the AC about how topic education is controlled by philosophical education. I mean, we have to have phil ed in order to have topic education because the philosophy by which the framework is decided is determines what arguments are relevant and not relevant on topic this uh, on topic education this means that in both worlds worst case scenario we have philosophy at philosophical education because it's a prerequisite to having topical education conceded argument which means that there's no net increase or decrease of philosophical education in either the world of the or, or, or of the af or the neg second problem here is you're conceding the argument that there is no uh, internal link into topic education back to fairness which means or back to education which means that there's only one piece of internal link which is the philosophical education arguments you're conceding the argument that philosophical education also happens in your world via topical education, which means that even if phil ed is bad, we both get phil ed. Additionally, uh, there's no re additionally, let's go down to the reasons why phil ed is bad. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. And then I would respond to all the terms. Uh, why, do you need, why do you need to? I think that would be... Because the reason you need to is because if the fairness debate is close, then the education debate would be the tiebreaker. Okay, sure. Right? Uh -huh. And then after that, I would have said... Now the next question we need to resolve is of which direction the ground debate flows on. If I win the access to the ground skew standard, I'm definitely winning the fairness debate because he has no other counter offense on ground. Yeah, wait, why why did uh well why did Bob go for a fairness outweighs? I don't understand. Because like he Because Bob have... probably thought his two arguments on ground were really good. Oh. Like if you saw the one AR was hedging its bets against Phil Ed. Yeah, almost entirely, what... right? Like the yeah. one AR went for really just like overkill on Phil Ed. Uh-huh. Right? Um the one AR did not think it would lose the fairness debate. Uh, and so Bob's two arguments on ground is the impact turn, that ground skew good because Neg wins majority of rounds as is. Uh, right. And then the no link, which is that you need to show util is unfair, otherwise there's no possible way of ground is skewed. Uh -huh, sure. The specificity of the interp could have solved the no link argument. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because right? Like, it's a question of you doing the practice. Like, even it, like, like it's, it's his response against the IME. Like, even if... Uh, yeah, even if... Utah is a hundred percent fair. It's like it's a question of whether you get to choose that framework for the debate. Yeah. Um, so the order of this two and R should have been theory, and on theory it should have started at the voter, then it should have won the standards, and then it should have dealt with all the five arguments on the inter uh, on the uh, violation. Uh -huh. After that, it should have made a big deal out of the fact that he did not extend any sort of violation in the one AR. Right, and said that this means worst case scenario for me, you evaluate the util debate. Okay. Best case scenario for you, me, you vote neg on AFC. Worst case scenario for me, you go down to who's ahead on the net benefits debate. Sure. Uh -huh. And then a one minute hammering of him being like, you can't forget to extend offense in semifinals of the TOC. Like, you probably need to extend your plan if you're going to read a plan text, right? Things like yeah. that. Um, and then extending the turn, obviously. Makes sense? Yeah. I would have also extended a presumed neg argument here, saying that uh, reading plan text means you concede presumption because you are shifting away from the squo, and we presume squo absent some sort of justification for that shift. Uh, why? Why do you? Uh, I would just make it in case some judge felt like the death turn was underdeveloped. Okay, sure, yeah. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. um, so this two and R salvage is salvageable. Uh -huh. It's not like the like the one in did not set up the two and R in a way that was most strategic, but this speech is still salvageable. Right. But the way the speech was currently given was just not good.
it was just not responsive. It went for the wrong issues, um, and it allocated time badly. Right? I think Reagan is probably really tired by then. Of course. I mean, I'm not criticizing Reagan. I've worked with him closely for this tournament. I really like him. We're still friends. Um, but I'm, so for me, it's not about who the debater was. It's about the arguments, right? Like, I don't think about the 2NR in terms of who gave it. I think about the 2NR in terms of the 2NR. Sure. So this 2NR needs to be better. Uh -huh. So for your redo, your 2NR is going to fix all those things we just talked about. Okay. Okay. So do you, want, do you have that written down, or do you want it one more time? Uh, no, I'm good. Okay, cool. So um, you can listen to the 2AR sometime on your own time if you're interested to see how this debate is resolved. Um, what not, was the decision? This is a 3 for the app. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this was semifinals of 2012 TOC. Um, so big picture lessons learned from this round. Uh, first is that the one end strategy against uh, a new app is crucial, right? You need to layer appropriately. And ideally, your up layering is not on a debate that they're most comfortable executing. Wait, sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, ideally, when you up layer, it's not on a debate they feel super comfortable engaging in, such as in this debate, AFC. Yeah. Additionally, you need to feel comfortable generating on the fly offense against new cases. Uh -huh. Right? Like, if in this round, you could have read T, then you could have read a shell and then you could have done util for two and a half minutes, you would have avoided the whole AFC mess. Right, yeah. Right? And that would have forced Bob to start all over again in the 1AR. Uh-huh. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. So you need to feel comfortable engaging the app on its own terms in addition to up layering. Uh -huh. Another big picture lesson is you always have to make sure you extend offense. Yeah. It's baffling that Reagan didn't punish Bob in this debate for not extending offense, right? It's like somehow Bob forgot to extend offense, and somehow Reagan forgot to notice that Bob didn't extend offense. Yeah. So in one of the biggest debates of the year, both debaters were making fundamental mistakes, uh -huh. right? In Bob's case, I'm sure he had it on his flow that he wanted to extend offense. Yeah. He just didn't get to it, right? In Reagan's case, I think he just brain farted and straight up didn't like think about the round holistically. I think that he was so used to going probably for his NC that I was like, oh, I always had to go for the NC. Like, he already had a mindset it's like, oh, Bob, it's probably better than me on YouTube debate. Like, I, well, I don't think Reagan had that mindset. I think Reagan was actually just as good as Bob at the YouTube debate. Reagan oh, was kind of, oh I, didn't, I didn't know. Like, I don't yeah, know I think thing. what happened to Reagan is he saw the drops on the pragmatism stuff huh? and thought that the framework debate was super clear in uh, favor of the negative. Huh? So he thought it wasn't a huge time investment to win a framework. Oh, fair enough. Right? But... It begs the question of why does he need to win a framework? Right. That's the exactly. question he's not asking himself, right? The reason Reagan was really um, sort of persuaded by winning framework or like in incentivized to win framework is because it was so easy. Right. But the question is not just how easy it is, but how useful it is, uh -huh. right? And in this case, it's not useful at all. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you're asking yourself what you're going for in the 2NR in prep time, you need to ask yourself not only what is easy, but what is useful. Okay. And in this case, what is most easy and useful is conceding util and going for the death turn. Right. Also, another big picture lesson is notice how the value of just one shitty five second, ten second turn on the AF can completely change the complexion of the debate. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. Had Reagan not made that quick little bad argument, <laughs> the 1AR uh, would not have really been in a lot of trouble had it not extended offense. Right, yeah. Make sense? Uh-huh. Um, another big picture lesson is that uh, the 2NR needs to be more responsive on the line by line to the 1AR when the 1AR puts a lot out on theory. Your 2NR cannot be big picture on theory. It needs to engage the line by line. Sure. Like on fairness, education, on fill ed, etc. Uh -huh. Right? Like that's not being done in this debate and it's going to cost Reagan the ballot. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh huh. Cool. So in terms of redos, we're going to redo both the 1AR and the 2NR. Sure. Um, Bob's 1AR was quite good. It was just lacking in those two areas. Reagan's 2NR was not very good. And mm -hmm. we're going to just change the structure of that 2NR altogether and sure. fix it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, do you have questions? Uh, I think there were like a lot of arguments I missed. Um, 
I'll share my flow document with you, and you can look at it. Um, okay. You can also go back through the video and catch whichever ones. Yeah. I missed a lot of the framework arguments, but I caught basically everything else. Oh, uh, okay. I missed also some of the theory arguments here and there, because Bob was blippy. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. Like, I fell on Phil. He made five arguments. I think I missed, like, two of them. Yeah, same. Yeah. Okay. Any yeah. other questions? Yeah, I'm good.